So welcome uh, to our panelists and to our audience. Um, I'm really delighted to be here um, hosting this conversation today uh, and presenting the Prack Voice of Racial Justice Award to Dr. Natalie Hopkinson, uh, marking our 30th anniversary. Um, so I'll start off with quick introductions of our two panelists. Um, first of all, I suppose I should introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Uh, Megan Haberly, I'm the Deputy Director at the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. Um, our two guests today are Dr. Natalie Hopkinson. Uh, she is our honoree um, and she is an assistant professor at Howard University's Department of Communication, Culture and Media Studies. She's the author of A Mouth is Always Muzzled, Six Dissidents, Five Continents and the Art of Resistance. Um, Go Go Live, The Musical Life and Death of Chocolate City, which came out in 2012 and is an ethnography and cultural history in Black Washington through the lens of Go Go music, as well as numerous articles uh, touching on themes of resistance, culture, uh, democracy, um, and the, the fine city of Washington, D.C., which will be a focal point of our conversation today. Uh, Dr. Hopkinson is also a co-founder of Don't Mute DC, which is an organization that supports GoGo -Go and works against the silencing of Black culture within the district. Uh, Cheryl Cashin is our other panelist here today. Um, she's an esteemed board member of the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. I'd be remiss not to note. Um, she was also a law professor uh, at Georgetown Law School and the author of several books um, on law and racial justice, uh, including White, Sp White Space Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding and Segregation in the Age of Inequality, um, which is coming out this year. Um, and that book is about the role of residential segregation and other devices of white supremacy in producing and perpetuating racial inequality, um, as well as about the potential of better policies to overcome this legacy. So I'm very excited about this conversation uh, between our two panelists, but I will take a moment first uh, to officially present Doc Dr. Hopkinson um, with our Voice of Racial Justice Award. Oh. Um, <laughs> it will be delivered soon by contactless <laughs> delivery, um, but I did want to uh, show you that we have this award in hand. Um, officially, this award was given in 2020, which is our 30th year anniversary here at Prac. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we ended up postponing this event, which was originally conceived of as an in-person presentation. Um, but I think that in a way it worked out for the better because you know we're reach reaching, I hope, a very wide audience here today. Um, and we really are very excited to present you with this award. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time because I wanna leave most of this uh, event for the two of you to speak in your own voices about a number of important issues. Um, but I will just say a few words about what it means to us as an organization uh, and to me as a staff person at PRAC to be presenting you um, with this award. Um, and for those of you who don't know PRAC, we are now a slightly over 30 year old uh, housing, uh, I'm sorry, federal policy organization based in Washington, DC. Um, we're a civil rights, racial justice organization and we focus largely on the issues of housing, education, uh, and environmental health and environmental justice. Our founding mission was connect to connect uh, research and advocacy. We've also built in a component of practice increasingly in the years, including some practice in the city of DC. Um, and of course, one of the points that you illustrate very compellingly in your writing is that for those of us who live in the city, the federal sphere of policy that we've often worked on and the local sphere of lived experience and policy are very much intertwined, um, as I know we'll be touching on later in our conversation. Um, I also want to say that, you know, as policy advocates, it's very much our trade and our training, um, I think, to speak very emphatically and clearly about policy points and policy asks. So you show up at the table, you have an opinion, you have an argument, you're being very clear and persuasive, and that's how you are effective in your job. Um, but it's also very important for us to sort of step back into a zone of complexity and ambiguity and asking questions. Um, and I think that the arts, writing about lived experience, writing, writing about history um, is an incredibly important place for us to do that as advocates and as human beings. Um, and it challenges us to ask questions and to grow. Um, and I think that you know, for many of us who do thinking about sort of democracy and the nature of democracy and democracy as a concept of you know, growth and challenge and evolution, um, you know, your work I think is very important to that kind of growth because um, you know, it's work about the arts, but it's very political work and it's work that is very unafraid to delve into complexities. 
Um, so thank you again so much for all that you do, all that you write about. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to the two of you um, to start our conversation. Um, so Natalie, um, I'd like to kick things off by uh, pointing to a phrase um, you know, that you've written about um, in your book about GoGo, which is that GoGo is a metaphor for the Black experience in the 20th century. And I thought this would be a good way to start the conversation because, um, you know, first of all, you can uh, talk to us a bit about what GoGo has meant to you and your work um, and DC. And then we can kind of use that as a springboard to talk about some of these metaphors and some of those aspects of the Black experience um, that we'd like to touch on today. Uh, so I'll just turn it over to you to talk about uh, what you meant by that phrase. First, thank you so much um, for this award and for this recognition. Um, it, it's it's just it really makes it um, it's it's just I'm so appreciative um, and humbled by it. And I also very appreciative of the work that you do as an organization. Um, so thank you. Um, so go go as a metaphor. Um, it's absolutely as a metaphor for the Black urban experience. So go go music is. DC's indigenous sound that was created by Chuck Brown, who we just heard in the intro. We heard Chuck, uh, Bustin Loose, one of his main, um, you know, most popular hits that he's had been sampled many times, but that actually reflects a sound. It's a bit of funk, it's a bit of uh, hip hop in there. It's, it's very Afro diasporic. You know, there's a lot of Afro Latin rhythms that are in there. And it's one of the best parties that you can experience in DC, if you're lucky to experience it. Um, it's also uh, almost completely segregated experience. So it really does reflect, um, you know, the history of the, the fact that it exists and that it's this whole uh, way of living and way of life in a part of uh, DC that's mostly uh, sealed off <laughs> from the white power structures in DC makes it um, you know, really makes it a way to kind of look at all these structures that created it. You know, of course, it's wonderful. It's beautiful art. You know, it harkens back to, um, you know, our, our history, centuries of our, our history. Uh, but it also reflects these housing, um, housing segregation, uh, you know, slavery, the history of slavery and battles over slavery and the things that replace slavery. And um, most recently, it's really, um, a good metaphor for a black voice, you know, that is being silenced in the air, you know, as gentrification is really devastating DC, GoGo -Go is also being silenced. And so a lot of the work that we've done recently around Don't Need DC is fighting back against that silencing of black voices um, and the, uh, and cultural erasure. Um, and Cheryl, could I invite you to respond and, and offer your thoughts to Natalie's comments um, and perhaps the connection to your own work? Yeah, so first off, I just um, want to thank you, uh, Natalie, for your work. And I'm delighted to be here. Natalie is one of my favorite people on earth. I, I just adore her. And I think, you know, her what she's been doing in the city for decades and her writing is so vital. And so I'm so happy we're honoring you, my friend. Um, <laughs> now, you know, this, this idea, the metaphor is so profound what you're saying, right? So, um, you know, we're, Black people are geniuses, right? We, we create stuff out of nothing, you know, and often out of isolation. I was, you know, uh, rereading some of your book this, this afternoon, you know, hip hop, comes out of a desolate time in New York in the 70s and and hip and and and, and go go comes out of a de desolate time for the city in the 70s here and um, so in, in my own work what what I'm, I'm I'm shining a light on is the fact that um, black people are living in a follow-on institution from slavery and Jim Crow it's iconic segregation and what we, what, what we have done for decades through policies and still do is we construct uh, and reify uh, concentrated black poverty and its 
opposite affluent white space. And we tend to overvalue and overinvest in affluent white space and devalue and disinvest, particularly in high poverty black neighborhoods, right? And so everything you say resonates with me when you talk about the metaphor of what's happening uh, with, with hip hop and the city. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's, I, we were talking earlier about, you know, on the Arts Commission, I joined Arts Commission about a year ago. And it's something that I noted that you definitely see very, very clearly, you know, as far as the art policy and this idea that we are investing in perpetuating privilege, you know, so there are whole art, the way that art is constructed, um, that it excludes so much, so many wide swaths of our city. And yet the way that the structures are, are in place, they, they're there to perpetuate that. So, you know, these are public goods, but yet they go disproportionately to people that already have privilege, you know? And so the people like art form, like incredible art forms like Go-Go Music, which are indigenous to DC, which grew, were created by the geniuses here that are loved by the people who live here, um, aren't even in the frame. Like they're just not even in the picture at all um, in any real, sort of structural way. So there's just so much work that has to be done to erase all these decades of disinvestment and also just a lack of just seeing people. Right. In your writings, you touch on um, themes of self-definition versus um, you know, sort of othering and often pathologizing, which can come from white people and is a part of white supremacy and the perpetuation of white supremacy. Um, and could you talk a bit about what that's meant in concrete terms in DC specifically, um, and then perhaps also more generally in our country? Yeah, so, um, you know, just going back to just using GoGo as a lens to understand, you know, sort of an idea about self-definition. So last year, Mayor Muriel Bowser made DC the official music, GoGo the official music of Washington, DC, which was a wonderful thing. Um, but a lot of what you hear from a uh, lot of GoGo -Go fans, GoGo -Go artists are like, we didn't need a proclamation to tell us that this is our official music. This has been, the, this is DC's music. We did not need something official saying that. And so, you know, it's sort of like, it's an alternate system of validation. Um, you know, it's part of like, it's part of, you're seeing neighborhoods and communities, you're hearing them shout it out, you know, during the course of a, a night of a party, that you know, it's an alternate system of valuing Black lives that often, you know, as I said, is just kind of off, off, off the frame, um, you know, in a lot of cases. And so that's really sort of where the power is. So I think a lot of times when we're talking about poverty and issues of, of segregation and exclusion, we're often looking at it through a deficit frame. And you know, what I think is really important is that you look at this as this is an asset. You know, so, so our, our art, our culture, these are assets, our way of life, things that have sustained us and allow us to survive, you know, this hellacious circumstances that we found ourselves, you know, with all of the, all of the things that have, these are our strengths. And so those are actually places for us to build, you know? And so I think it's important to think about it that way. And, and that's much in the same way that, you know, you have to have, to be able to survive, you kind of have to have an oppositional um, phrase on everything, because if you accept what the dominant, um, you know, what dominant messages are, then you say that your life doesn't matter, you know, and so it's, it's really is important to have these spaces that you re you affirm yourself on your own terms, you define yourself, affirm yourself on your own terms. Yeah, so, so what you're saying reminds me of uh, this uh, famous sociological study of um, the, the Black Belt neighborhoods of Wash, uh, not Washington DC, I'm saying Chicago, um, the Black metropolis, I believe the scholars were Drake and Caton, I may begin the name wrong, but um, this was an area of concentrated Blackness and a lot of, of, of poverty and, and, and things like that, but they used the term Bronzeville to describe the, the, the rich cultural stuff that was going on there, you know? So he, he, despite, you know, um, so there was like self-love going on in, 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 in describing this community and, the, and, and 
you know, the race men and women who operated in it and, and all, all of what the good things that came out of it. Um, and it's a lens that you would not see from, um, these were black sociologists, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lens that you would not see in uh, the, the way that a lot of people who write about these communities, the pathologizing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so self-love is really, really important. Um, but I'm also calling and, and on, um, you know, in this um, year of, 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 of reckoning since George Floyd's death, and people who um, say that Black Lives Matter, and there are a lot of uh, allies who do that. You know, I walk in my neighborhood, the signs are all there, that um, we need people outside of these communities to value the folk who live there and see them as three-dimensional human beings capable of their own um, 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 liberation, you know, and, and, and charting their own course. And if, if the state um, would change the relationship with these neighborhoods from punitive to caring and change the lens for seeing people um, rather as, as, as threats and, and, and stereotypes of pathology and instead see them as, as assets, you know, uh, worthy of the moniker citizen, it frees you up to pursue much more saner policies that are much cheaper and more effective than policing and predation, right? Um, so, you know, we need to love ourselves, but other people need to, 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 to bring that love too, you know? Absolutely. I mean, that's something that I talk about with my students a lot, you know, where we're talk we talk about the sort of dominant public sphere, you know, versus a black public sphere. So within our sort of segregated realities that we have, that most of the country has, you know, it's not just Howard, uh, which is an HBCU, <laughs> most of the country is segregated. Um, and so we, so there's a tendency because of that segregation to say, um, well, you have to love yourself. You have to respect your, you have to, and you have to get your, get yourselves together, black people, you know, and that's not it. Like, that's not like everybody needs to get ourselves together as a whole collective, you know, whether you're, you know, you live in a segregated black community or you live in a segregated white community, they're not separate in the sense that our responsibility um, for, for uh, building them and, and solving the challenges there, their collective challenges. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of symbolism, right, around the Black Lives Matter. And, you know, even just sort of looking at, at a lot of my work around GoGo, like I, symbols are extremely important but you really do have to have the policies to match that. So if Black Lives Matter, then that means that you don't send a police officer to deal with a mental health challenge, you know, or you don't send a police officer in a school and, you know, handcuff children. You know, if, if Black Lives Matter, there are certain policies that you do to match that rhetoric. So that's really where, you know, a, a lot of the hard work that um, that that your organization is doing like that's really that's that's a lot of hard work that happens but but the, the symbols are important and so if they so you have to make affirmative steps toward saying that black that meaning that black lives matter you know that means not hoarding so I love the title of your book <laughs> Cheryl can you repeat the title again um, white space black hood opportunity hoarding and segregation in the age of inequality. There you go, opportunity hoarding. <laughs> that has to stop. And that means that people who have privilege and are used to getting privilege have to relinquish that privilege, you know? And that's something that historically, and that's something that doesn't naturally happen, um, but it's something that has to happen more and more of. And so, you know, you know in my little world, um, the, where I'm working in, in the arts and culture, you know, that means that you take affirmative steps toward including. So if, if GoGo is the official music, then that means they get official uh, investments. They get official infrastructure. They get official arts grants. You know, like these are things that have to happen. And it's also not about necessarily forcing, um, forcing again, using the metaphor of GoGo, forcing this one culture into the frame, into the dominant, you know, European dominated frame. You know, it means maybe we have to blow up the frame and reimagine what art is, 
you know, and how we value it and how we evaluate it. You know, it looks very, ballet looks a lot different than, you know, Chuck Brown, right? So, so you know, you need, to, you need to adapt and our systems need to adapt. Right, and I, I want to underscore with this opportunity, Horty, this happens even with black run governments, right? Um, in, in my book, I have a, a case study chapter on Baltimore and um, because of the innovative work of, 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 of some academics and scholars there, particularly Dr. Lawrence Brown, um, there's an equity movement there where they instituted a program where they actually looked at the data for where dollars were going for development. And they found that even with the majority, see, they're, they are chocolate city still, right? They have black mayors and a majority on the city council. Even with that representation, they found that they were spending four times as much money for development in white areas than black neighborhoods. Right, but you have to track this, right? And so now they're doing it, and they they've changed their charter, and they're really on the equity tip, right? Well, DC needs some of that. They absolutely, DC absolutely needs some of that because, um, you know, it's sort of like the path of least resistance is to just sort of keep investing in the places that you've always been investing, keep um, oiling the squeaky wheels that are the, the squeakiest, the people who are just in your face all the time. It's easy just to do that and it's easy for everybody. And then, um, but like the work that has to happen, you know, if we're really going to have a reckoning, that means that we start doing, um, you know, we, we start just doing the hard work. Let me interject. I should have said this at the beginning, but we're aiming to reserve the last 15 to 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, so if you're out there listening, please don't be shy. And I believe that the chat function on YouTube um, is open all throughout this conversation um, for you to enter questions. Um, and then we'll, we'll leave that time at the end. Um, so I just wanted to interject that point. Um, my next question, um, Natalie, is that I found a lot of really interesting contrasts and, and interplays in your book. Um, and one of them is that, you know, of course, segregation is both a means and a result of oppression. Um, but there is a lot of uh, what you call exuberance. I think we also hear the term black joy often, um, you know, that was to be found in the Chocolate City and still is. Um, so I'm curious if you could speak to that contrast um, a bit. And then Cheryl, maybe I could turn it over to you to talk about some of the policy implications there. Yeah, so we heard a lot about Black Joy last year, uh, especially around the Black Lives Matter movement, and actually just wrote a piece for, um, for a journal uh, about the don't you DC meets Black Lives Matter protests last year. And so there were so many, so I, I talked about Juneteenth for instance last year, which was um, really historic for DC because this was of course when Trump had announced a rally in Oklahoma on Juneteenth, um, which was such a symbolic slap in the face of the history of the, you know, the race riots in Oklahoma and also Juneteenth, which is a celebration of emancipation. So it was a total, um, insult uh, to Black people. And uh, a lot of the uh, cultural organizers, including Don't Me DC and others um, in DC, like I've, ne I've never seen that many go-go bands. There were at least five go-go um, protests that day. Um, there were four different trucks. And I was on one of them with EU, uh, which went from the Howard Theater and went all the way down to Black Lives Matter Plaza. Hundreds of people followed us in the rain. Uh, people were with their umbrellas. People stopped with dancing. I mean, there's incredible photography and footage um, from that day. And it was out of the saddest, most like, you know, we don't know whether Trump is ever going to leave the city. We don't know whether, you know, there's militarization of the city. You know, Trump has ordered the National Guard in. You know, there's all these things that have come in. But in the midst of that, it was one of the most beautiful um, and joyful experiences that I've ever uh, you know, been able to witness. And that is how, why we're still here, I believe. Um, because why do you get up every day in a place that tells you that your life is meaningless? You know, that tells you that you are, um, you know, that your life doesn't have value, your children's lives don't have value. You know, how do you get up every day? How do you have children and bring them into this, you know, without having some sort of outlet, without having some sort of way to sort of express um, joy, 
and release tension on your own terms. So that's why, you know, cult, the cult, Black culture is really important, um, you know, in providing that release and also providing that oppositional, um, you know, these oppositional messages that challenge the, st the, the status quo and challenge what the power structures are saying. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a civil rights family and, and you know, my father particularly was a, a self-identified agitator, you know, Frederick Douglass was his hero, right? I mean, he was a dentist by profession, but I just, you're, you're saying this, I think of joy in, in black culture, but also joy in black activism. You know, my parents were activists and, and, and engaged and they had fun doing it and even, you know, you, anybody who's been involved in activism, you're going to have days when you get your teeth kicked in, you're going to have, have your losses, but there's joy in the fight, right? I, I think of um, Bell Hooks has a famous essay. I can't remember the title, but it's about the necessity of love in activism, you know, and in, in, in civil rights and abolition work. But one of the things she says, it's not just so there's self-love, right? But there's also, um, it's a lesson for allies, um, those who are outside of this culture about what you gain when you enter the fray, you know, um, f for black life, you know, for, 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 you know, advancing the cause of racial justice, right? Um, and, <laughs> You, there's a lot to be gained, right? In, in liberating yourself from the ideologies that this country has been so caught up in for so long, right? Um, it's, yeah. It, right, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and it's, it's just also, I mean, there's something also subversive and joyful about how much it irritates people. Like the black, there's so, why does it irritate people? Why are the drums so irritating? Um, we had, I was just talking to somebody at the Library of Congress this week and they told me about an incident, which I don't know that got a lot of publicity, if any. Chuck Brown gave a performance on, he was invited to perform a concert in 2002 um, uh, outside the Library of Congress and he was performing, which was, you know, amazing for the culture. And uh, somebody from the Supreme Court called over to the Library of Congress and said, could you turn that noise off? Right, and so, so 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 they were trying to actually mute. The Supreme Court was actually trying to mute Chuck Brown, and so <laughs> we, they and you know, and then actually that was the end of it too. So they, they the message came too late, so they actually didn't end up because it was a lunchtime concert. Um, so they didn't actually turn off the music because it was kind of too late to get everything you know turned down or whatever. But it did mute uh, the music because they never did any more outdoor series after that concert series after that you know so it's just like what a what a barren place you know country we are without that joy and without that exuberance and without that and and yet there are all these forces that are they're constantly conspiring to silence them why yeah you know i i am showing my age here, but, you know, I first came to work in the city for a, in a summer job in the mid 80s. And I, I just will never forget in, in, you know, 19, summer of 86, the sounds of go-go were everywhere in this city, right? Everywhere. Um, it was just like, it oozed everywhere. Just kind of like when you go in, in, in New Orleans, it's jazz, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, um, and, and everybody knew the music. Um, and now it, it is so sad to me that it's, it's rare. Sometimes I see kids with the plastic buckets outside the, uh, the place where the Wizards play. Is it still mm -hmm. the Rising Center? I can't yeah, remember. yeah. Yeah, you know, but it used to be everywhere. And, and um, I think pe people of all colors at that time knew it was like the indigenous music of the city. And now there's so many people who have no idea, I think. And they're, you know what, they're missing out. Yeah. <laughs> they're missing out. So, you know, that's part of the thing. It's like, you know, it's bringing back music in the schools, you know, it's reinvesting, you know, so again, this is an asset that, you know, should be, um, you know, should be supported, invested in. And, um, and I, I think that everybody's richer for that, spiritually richer for that. Cause it's also, you know, you, there's the, 
you know, there's it just, it's a spiritual thing. Right. The drum. This is, this is quite a contrast, but let's talk about the federal city uh, for a moment. So another contrast in your book is of, you know, DC as the chocolate city, as a cultural vineyard, uh, but also as a seat of primarily white power that's been used in very nefarious ways, including on the population um, of DC. Um, so could you tell our audience a bit more about, you know, that history and what it's meant for your work? Yeah, so um, DC, because it's at the seat of power, uh, because it is a colony, essentially, of Congress, there's no, um, you know, representation in the Senate, no voting representation in the Senate, um, and not true control, I mean, limited home rule control over the city. Um, it is also the place where when there's an urban policy, they try it here first. So, you know, you started with like even early experiments and in, um, integration with schools integration happen here in DC. Um, uh, th there are so many experiments that happen because of DC status. And one of those most recently that sort of aligned with the rise of GoGo -Go was uh, mass incarceration. So DC is actually, you know, uh, the capital of mass incarceration as well. And, um, you know, GoGo -Go again is a frame to sort of understand that because, um, you know, that sort of shows how the, the music was ended up being criminalized. Um, and so much of DC had been criminalized period. And so this whole industry that arose around the music was really an opportunity for people to have jobs, people to have businesses, people to uh, be able to, you know, make a living, raise their families. You know, it, it, it was a way to sort of resist that because, you know, if you create an alternate framework, then nobody cares whether, you know, there's no box to check and nobody, you know, it's, it's you, you take it with a grain of salt, um, somebody's record you take with a grain of salt. And um, so that's, that's part of how, um, you know, some of the federal policies that come, have come out end up disproportionately um, impacting uh, a DC and, you know, influencing the culture as well. Yeah, so I, I didn't realize till I read your book that that uh, Go Go itself was really criminally criminalized, and you know that they were surveilling um, Go Go bands and following them. You know that, that which is devastating, but um, you know a parallel. So your book is it's Go Go Live is the the, the the title, right? Yes. Yes. We need to get that in there. People yes, should, yes, you're a beautiful writer. You're just Thank a you. beautiful writer. So it's, it's so well told, right? But a parallel to that is uh, James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even in a city where Democrats outnumber um, Republicans by 12 to 1, and even when Black people were in power, um, what did they do? You, you know, they pursued a lot of the same policies that led to mass incarceration everywhere. Now there were demands for, for, for things beyond just policing and car, car incarceration as well. But it, you know, for, for me, this underscores an important point. You talk about class distinctions in, in your book, right? Um, I, I, in, in my forthcoming book, um, I use the term descendants for people trapped in high poverty black neighborhoods. I think they are, people trapped in high poverty black neighborhoods are, are the true descendants of slavery and Jim Crow, right? And there's a degree of othering of the people in the hood, right? Um, and, and, you know, a lot of upper income people of all colors participate in that, right? Um, and so the, the, you're, you're talking about the way in which Gogo -Go itself is stereotyped as a, you know, the music of low income working class people. Um, it, that resonates with me, you know, we got some problems. Oh yeah, Inter <laughs> absolutely. Here's classes and problems. Absolutely, and that, you know, just going back to what Megan was mentioning about the ambiguity, I mean, you have to have room for that. So Gogo yeah, -Go is definitely class, but I've also talked to people who were part of Jack and Jill. They also had Jack and Jill Go-Go's back in the 80s too. You know, they also had, uh, I was talking to Sidwell friends, um, they had their first, they actually sent me the first contract for a go-go band to play for the Black Student Union at Sidwell Friends was in 1984. You know, so you have it, but by and large, it is class. So for youth culture, it definitely crosses class boundaries. But as you, as the, the bands get older, 
it definitely breaks down by class. And um, yeah, they were all black people were in charge of everything when GoGo -Go was really criminalized. They passed laws. So until Kenny McDuffie introduced this legislation, making GoGo -Go the official music, those laws were still on the books that made it illegal for young people to be at a GoGo, -Go, specifically a GoGo -Go place after a certain time. So these curfew laws that came about in the 80s targeted GoGo -Go specifically. So, you know, and these were all black people in charge because they're all dealing with, I mean, so we have an issue of guns flooding into the city. You know, you have drug addiction issues around drug addiction. Um, depending on who they are, they're, depending on who the victims are, there's a very different policy response. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and George, in the, the book Locking Up Our Own, he's sort of pointing out that, you know, that people are really, they, they just don't know what to do. Um, but I know that when, you know, ma uh, mass shootings hit white communities, the response is very different. And when the drug epidemic hit white communities, um, you know, more recently, there was a much different, it wasn't to just lock everybody up, you know? And so that's, I mean, that, and so we've internalized, a lot of black leaders have internalized this logic of white supremacy um, and a logic of uncritically, you know, looking at, um, uh, you know, policy challenges as well. Well, th thankfully, I think DC has evolved. You know, um, the attorney general and the mayor are competing with each other for different kind. Of, they both have different innovative strategies of investing in social services um, and wrapping social services and outreach and care around the folks who are most likely to be victims of gun violence and also the folks who are most likely to pull the trigger, right? But um, there's still a lot more to do. So, right. you know, DC, you do, you do federal, you do part of the colonial piece that we talked about. If you, this is something that Ronald Moten, who also works on with the co-founder of Don't Me DC, he's worked on on this issue a lot, where in DC, you do local crime, you do federal time. So we have hundreds of DC residents who are serving uh, prison sentences outside the city um, all over the place. Right, so it's like all of these. So that's a big issue. So that's a big issue for um, you know that's that's actually on the table right now, and it's a social justice issue. You know, so you've thrown them, you've you've dis dispersed them all around the city. Um, there's a big challenge to get halfway houses so they can come back and a pathway back to come back. And then not to mention, um, by some estimates, there are seventy thousand returned citizens in D.C. You know, again, this is this is a legacy of mass incarceration and the footprint on DC. So how do we treat them? What are the policies that we treat? How do we treat them? You know, for the Arts Commission, that's something that I learned very early in the Arts Commission. They had a box that you had to check initially. I mean, it's been removed, um, you know, with a core masters, Barry and I had, you know, advocated to have it removed, but they still asked for your arrest and criminal record, you know, in order to get a, to apply for a grant. And it's like, what does that have to do with you blowing a saxophone or painting a picture, whether you've been, you know, whether you've been arrested or not. But, you know, these are the things that are still like, they're not, this isn't like the distant past. These are policy issues that are still facing us right now. Right. Another issue that you've both touched on quite a bit is the role of wealth and wealth extraction, um, you know, in defining our cultural and physical spaces. And, you know, of course, this is something we can see very much in the built environment um, in housing policy and elsewhere. Um, could you speak a bit to that uh, in DC? When you, what do you mean you. when you say wealth? <laughs> you, both, you, both, you both written about this theme. Cheryl, why don't I start with you first? Okay, okay. So, um, I, I don't profess to know the specifics about DC, but I know that DC, um, just like every other um, black city with a lot of black neighborhoods, uh, predatory lenders preyed on, on black people and, and created a national foreclosure crisis um, because segregated segregation enabled the predators of Wall Street to identify black neighborhoods for these usurious projects that they you know, would not bring to white people in white neighborhoods. And something like half of black wealth was just wiped out, right? We went from the black white wealth gap 
was pushed back to where it had been in 1968, at the, which was where the beginning of the fair housing movement started. And in fact, even after the foreclosure crisis, um, white home ownership rates recovered, black home ownership rates didn't recover. And in fact, there's a new generation of play, preying on black people. The, the uh, hedge funds are to, right now investing or uh, circling in black neighborhoods that had a lot of foreclosures and peddling installment contracts. The very same installment contracts that um, um, were prayed, used to prey upon black people in the, like the 50s and the 60s. It just doesn't stop, right? The home ownership gap between whites and blacks is where it was in 1890. And, and it's, it, you know, and it, this is, this is um, and so DC had this happen, you know, um, and, you know, at some point, and you know, Ta-Nehisi's uh, case for reparations article cover the Atlantic really gets into this. There has to be a reckoning, right? Um, uh, because it's not, you know, it, 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 it's gross. It's gross. It, it, it's right? gross. And I mean, so there's been some pretty innovative research in DC around that issue. So um, Prologue DC is a, a couple of local um, uh, historians and they've done this uh, mapping segregation project where they're looking even just going, so even from before the, uh, the housing acts of the 60s, um, you know, they're looking at how these um, housing covenants, you know, really shape DC, you know, and the racial covenant. So they've mapped all of them. So you can go on, they have a tool where you can look and look up your house and see. Um, and how, and so they really have charted this whole history of how the, the, the neighborhoods turn white. Um, you know, for, for instance, my neighborhood is Bloomingdale um, in DC, and you can really look and see how the neighborhood, like within, you know, as soon as the, the neighborhoods became integrated and a lot of these, um, you know, these, these racist policies came off the books, there was just massive amounts of white flight. And like, so with, for instance, in my neighborhood, it was really over like a period of five years where you just saw like people, white people just in mass, just turned around and left. Right, and they took all their resources with them. They, with the help of the federal government, you know, and um, you know, building up new um, housing out in the suburbs. And so, in the core of the city, you know, has been dealing with this disinvestment that's gone on for so long. And then, in the last twenty years, you know, you know, it was like another collective decision that was made by white people to come back, you know. And so, and then, so it's like this vicious cycle of placement, displacement, placement, displacement of Black people. And so it's like we are often just looking for a place where we can live in peace, you know? And so this is like, this is the struggle. This is the challenge that we have. So my last question before we go to audience questions, um, you know, is to say that as, as policy advocates, we're always trained to look at things with a critical eye, but still be ever hopeful, um, you know, and sort of look to how we can improve things, how we can make things better. Um, so what's sustaining you or giving you hope, you know, when you look at the situation today in our country and in DC? So Natalie. what, what sustains me is, um, you know, again, I just finished this piece looking at Juneteenth last year is the resistance, you know, is, you know, just sort of understanding the very long history of struggle, um, that our people and the people whose shoulders that we stand on. So as, as difficult as things seem now, I think about my grandmothers, you know, who had limited education, limited opportunities. Um, you know, it was infinitely worse and yet they got up every day. They had me, they had my, you know, had my parents. They, you know, so I, I draw a lot of strength and um, hope in, um, you know, just this, just understanding like what strong people that we come from, you know, and, um, also, I think there was something about George Floyd that is, you know, I call him a portal. Like it's something happened. Like it shifted, it somehow, he opened up a space and shifted, he just shifted the atmosphere to where somehow things that were very apparent to a lot of us <laughs> for a long time are apparent to more people all around the world. And so, you know, the challenges, so I think that the awareness is there 
And so the challenge right now is just the follow through. You know, do we have the follow through? Can we sustain our attention, you know, on the challenge long enough to find sustainable solutions? You know, not window dressing, not token change, but systemic, fundamental, rip it up and start over sort of structural change. So that's what gives me hope. I'll just say really quickly so we can get to questions. My, my answer is similar. I'll just add the, the, the activism of Black people in 2020 and other people who are taking their rightful place in politics, not just registering to vote, but also running for office, mm -hmm. right? But um, there's an ascendant multiracial coalition. You know, Black people have, as you say, this portal idea. Black people have more allies than they've ever had in the United States. Now there, 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 there are problems out there, but I'm, I am, you know, this ascendant coalition uh, saved Biden's campaign. You had a president of the United States run on a campaign where he centered racial justice, you know, and he's talking the talk. So that's exciting to me. You just have to, but you never get stopped to stop organizing, mobilizing and winning elections. Yeah, and it was just beautiful, just really quickly, just the Black Lives Matter protest, which I ended up you know, following my daughter into. Um, and they were, it was multiracial. It was. It's like I saw it with my own eyes and I was actually shocked. So, you know, people mm -hmm. in my neighborhood who I just never imagined, I'm like, well, where are you going? And they're holding Black Lives Matter signs and walking <laughs> to the same place. I was like, oh, okay. And if you saw how just, it was not, and that's part of what made it very powerful, you know, right. that it was, they were multi, it was, there were young white people, you know, and older white people and uh, Asians for Black Lives Matter and Latinos for Black Lives Matter, everybody together. And, and that, it really did end up making a difference. So I don't know that, I mean, we can be cynical about a lot of things, uh, but things could have gone another way. Yeah. So, well, and, and it was, you know, and that's, that's reason to hope. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I'll go to audience questions, um, and if you're out there, please feel free to type in your questions to the chat box. Um, so the first one is for Natalie. Are you familiar with Zydeco? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that quite right. It's similar to GoGo, -Go, but I believe it was developed in the Southwest by Black communities as an offshoot of R&B and gospel. Has this phenomenon happened in other cities and regions in the U.S.? So basically, are there analogs to the GoGo -Go movement uh, in other places that you're aware of? So I'm not familiar with Sadiko. So I'm not, I'm not from, I haven't heard of that before. Um, is that Zydeco? Are you, is it Zydeco? 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 Yeah. Zydeco. Yes. Zydeco. Oh, Zydeco. Yes, yes, yes. I'm familiar I'm with I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I'm familiar with Zydeco. And um, I'd say, yes. So there, are, there is, there's regional music. And so that's part of like how corporatization of music industry has sort of suppressed a lot of that. You know, you just have, um, so it's suppressed it, but it doesn't mean it's completely suppressed it. So there are regional music forms, you know, Baltimore has house, Chicago has its own house, there's Baltimore house, Chicago house, you know, there's, um, there, there's different regional styles of hip hop, um, there's global styles of hip hop, there's, um, you know, one of my students did her dissertation on grime music in London, which has, it's a mm -hmm. wonderful analog uh, to go-go and a lot of, um, so it's sort of like a, it's an offshoot of hip hop. And what's, what's amazing is that a lot of, there's so many similarities, you know, across space. And that, you know, so that's why I like the idea of voice, you know, and giving uh, voice to people's identity, people's local identity that sort of taps into, you know, our history is just, it's really powerful. Um, and then the, my favorite analog, it, you know, so Zydeco is like, you know, in, in Louisiana as well, but like uh, brass bands. I think they're the closest one in the U.S. is the brass bands, you know, so they're part of the way of life in New Orleans, very analogous to go-go um, go-go um, go bands and how they're they're part of the way of life here. Very cool. So there'll be sequels to your book. <laughs> yeah. Um, so next question is, you mentioned a shift to equity as Baltimore's Black leaders became aware. Do you think D.C. Ma maintains inequitable policies because most of the city's residents are well off, uh, which makes it easy to disregard east of the river residents who are largely low to moderate income. Um, today, the east of the river uh, areas in DC 
uh, both skyrocketing house housing values that are plagued by poor performing schools, crime, and lots of whites moving into those communities. I'm gonna sure. look into that one. <laughs> You want you want me to go? You go. I was gonna say yeah, because you're more. You have you have much more of your finger on the pulse of what's happening. Okay, so um, so the question is, are is there analogous to like the sort of bold moves that Baltimore is making? Is that happening in D.C. too? Yeah, and if not, yeah. why not? Yeah. So and does it does it have something to do with sort of our particular pattern here of segregation and economic vulnerability in particular places? So we are seeing some of that. So I would say there's a couple new uh, council uh, members of the council, like Janice um, Lewis is very progressive, and, and she's she's as pretty as progressive as they come. So that's encouraging. Also, Christina Henderson also is a progressive that joined the council. So that's those are positive. Kenya McDuffie has done, he's just started an office of the uh, core, the council office on racial equity, um, which is very promising, you know, doing a review of council activity. You know, he also has introduced uh, legislation around studying reparations, you know, so that kind of goes directly to it. Whether we get to it, you know, whether we get to actually defunding, whether we start to see that is that, you know, we'll see. So I'm seeing some of it. Um, I see like, you know, you, you hear some of the, the talk around it and, you know, I, I think there needs to be a lot more. So, uh, I noticed the mayor just announced this $15 million emergency center that's gonna be in Ward 8 that's supposed to, um, you know, flush a lot of services and, you know, one-on-one -on -one service delivery for folks there, but we'll see. We'll see what it, what it amounts to. Yeah, we'll see. And then I think the place that they probably have the work, like things need to, the most radical intervention that I haven't seen anybody in their in leadership in DC really embrace is around education. Like, how are you just going to continue? We've had 20 years of nonstop, like just straight up privatization, straight up and that has never gone well for us in our communities. And um, there's ne there's very few voices. And actually, I, I'm I'm trying to count, like what are the voices for equity and education? You know that that are outside the frame of okay, keep privatizing everything. You know, so that's that's an area that needs to be. So like Ward Eight in particular, um, they have the highest levels of you know privatization of education, and they have all like there's so many research. Ward Eight is not and seven and eight, they are not, um, there, there has, there's been a lot of programs and initiatives and ideas. And, you know, at, at some point, I just think that, when do you just start cutting people checks? Like just, um, like just start cutting people checks. I, I should say one of the movements I'm excited about is a number of cities, uh, Stockton, California is one of them has, um, they piloted universal basic income pilots where they just cut checks to people who are trapped in high poverty and, and, and surprise, surprise, people do better, you know? <laughs> $500 a month can make a lot of difference in someone's life, you know, where they just, no strings attached, you know. Um, anyway, so they're, they're about, there are 25 mayors in the country that, that are on this tip of trying to promote this idea. We have another question here relating to education. Um, what roles can K-12 schools in DC play in affirming Blackness in the curriculum, particularly in the arts and humanities? How can we be liberating and educate on DC's Black history? I, I love this question so much. Um, and it actually goes to kind of, you know, so we, DC has a very unique challenge that, um, actually it's unique because we're hybrid, uh, privatized, private control and public and you know public control in schools and so it is very difficult to do anything actually <laughs> because anything could be undone because of the instability of the whole sector schools are opening schools are closing um, they're trying this curriculum they're you know failing at that they're you know so there's so much instability that happens it's really difficult to like push through anything that's that I mean that's something that just straight up makes sense you know, if you're a DC, if you're a child that comes up in DC, 
you know, in whether it's a charter school or a private uh, or a, a or private or a, a neighborhood school, that you should know there are certain core things that should be part of what you know as DC, like the history of DC as a chocolate city, which, you know, I'm always reminding people, it's not past tense. DC, black people are still the largest ethnic group. And I think that was one of the other questions somebody said that, you know, because white people are the, the most, the majority, they're not. White rich people are not the majority. <laughs> they're just seen the most and they're heard from the most. Um, so, I think that's a real um, challenge. And so I've seen organizations like uh, Teaching for Change. I'm like a huge fan of them. Um, they do a lot of work around um, curriculum development that could go across both sectors, but it's just really difficult to, it's hard to like move forward in this environment and sort of guarantee anything um, for a child that grows up in DC. And that is unacceptable. Um, there's another question here. I think this is directed at you, Natalie. What do you think of the recent upheaval at Mosaic Theater? I'm actually not familiar with what that is about. Cheryl, you look like you might know something about that. Oh, I don't. I might have to Google that. Okay. Move on to the next Jose, question. Apo have... Apologies to the person who posed that question. Yeah, um, are DC residents overall too comfortable to elect courageous leadership that is truly <coughs> concerned about the least uh, the least of these because it doesn't benefit them. I'm gonna let you have that one too, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> You're the, the resident expert. <laughs> Absolutely not, not, I'm not satisfied. I'll just say that. Like there's nobody for, for such, and so this is a thing about the Dome UDC movement that I'll say that I, I, I really appreciate. For all the years that I've been living in DC, I've been hearing this narrative about, oh, the city is gone black, from among black people. Oh, it's gone. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, they're taking over, they're pushing us out. Um, we don't matter. And it was this little symbolic victory of this man who's play, been playing, um, excuse me, this, this man who's been playing music, go-go music on his corner for 20 years and gentrifiers tell him to turn it off. And he calls, you know, they, they that whole battle over it and how hard that we were able to push back with go-go concerts in the streets and protests and the petition and tens of thousands of people signed a petition from around the world. And we got this one little thing where, okay, the music is back on, right? It's, 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 it's a small thing that's symbolic that we were able to move into other areas. So we were able to then, okay, well, let's, oh, they wanna cut funding to United Medical Center, the hospital, the only hospital in Ward 7 and 8. Okay, we're gonna do a go-go in the hospital. We're gonna put pressure on the city council to back off and they did, you know, it worked. And so, you know, we've been able to sort of like use this as a, uh, you know, a way to speak back to a lot of those things. And I think it scared a lot of politicians in the city that got real comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, their, their campaigns are funded by, you know, developers and people who have an interest in continuing to accelerate this process of uh, black erasure and removal from DC. And so, you know, it's like these little things that are really important to just show that okay, we're here, we have a voice and we can be organized and we're gonna push back and we're watching. And so I wanna see that. That's why I've been working a lot with the activists and I'm continuing to, um, you know, continuing to just spend a lot of time organizing because, you know, that voice is so powerful um, when it's, um, you know, when it's harnessed because no, they're not doing what, they're, they're, they're not, nobody's doing enough. Fantastic. And on that note, um, it is 4 p.m. on the dot, we're at time. Um, so I want to thank you uh, both so much, uh, Natalie. Congratulations again. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, and thank you to all of our audience members. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.